believe I'm, I'm the next speaker. Uh, let's see what do I have. Got 20 minutes. Um, also, just going to just speak to that, to that last point, just to give you some perspective of how do we get to where we are, just a little bit on, on, on that question of um, how does the FDA look at things uh, and why are they looking at this differently. Um, recognize that for a good five, ten years at least, uh, you had manufacturers who would make medical image uh, viewing software and they figured, okay, it's going to go on a PC. And, you know, and that PC is going to be a PAX workstation. Well, what makes a PC a PAX workstation? It's really, there's only one thing that's special about it. There's no special processor for a PAX workstation. There's no special RAM for, for you know, for, there's no special keyboard or mouse. I mean, you may want to get a little better input device. But for the most part, the only thing that really makes it a PAX workstation versus just a regular PC, for the most part, is, is the display. And the display part, you know, the FDA would look at it and say, well, yeah, we clear displays for PACs, you know, to use. We got all kinds of medical displays. And if you use one of those and slap it onto a computer, it's not like, you know, well, if you get the AMD processor versus the Intel processor, it's going to process it any differently. It's not. It may be a little faster, reliable, I don't know, whatever. It may break less. But it's not, your, your picture's not going to come out different because you used one flavor of processor, another one amount of RAM, another or anything like that. It's really just a display. So they figured, OK, you got, your, you got software. The software is going to run on some kind of computer, and the Windows computer or whatever it is. And then it's just you have to work with the display. And either they'll use a medical display or they won't. But that's the, menu, the software manufacturer can't control that. But, they, but their, their expectation is, if you're using medical software, use it on a medical monitor, and you'll be good to go. You know? And then that, that wasn't the software manufacturer's headache. But the moment that software manufacturers started making software for, you know, for iOS, for, you know, for iPhone, iPad, or for Droid, or for whatever, then the FDA said, stop. You can't say, it's not my problem anymore, because you know what hardware it's going on. Don't tell me that you think, well, I, I don't know about what's up. You, you're writing it only for one platform. You're writing it not just for an operating system. You're writing it for a hardware platform. And now you do have to take responsibility for that hardware platform and the display that's going to be used. And one thing's for sure, it ain't a medical display. <laughs> you know, it's something else. You know, and whether or not that's OK is something that now that software manufacturer does have to take responsibility for. Because they've, uh, if you look at that, the, the guidance that Aldo was referring to uh, that came out about a year and a half ago, something like that, um, uh, it's, um, you know, it, it explains when does a device become a medical device. You know, clearly, Apple doesn't manufacture medical devices. But when, you know, and if I, if I take a, uh, you know, a mobile device and I put a, uh, you know, some kind of uh, audio amplifier on it uh, and attach it to it so that it can, uh, you know, put a microphone on it so it can, you know, take in sound, it's still, it's not a medical device. And if I put a, headphones on the thing, it's not a medical device. But if I market this thing with this microphone and these headphones to put onto your heart to listen to heart sounds, well, now I've got an electronic stethoscope. Now it's a mobile medical device. And now you do have, you're going to market it like that, that it can be used for that. Then you have to worry about it, and now you have to take into account all these factors. And the same thing, you know, if you, you, know, you it's the same thing just in the analog world. If you take a magnifying glass, say, magnifies things. It's not a medical device. Magnifies mammograms. Now it's a medical device. So it depends on intended use, and uh, and that's uh, and that's that's where we are with this. Is that the software manufacturers? Uh, if you're making PAC software, uh, it's pretty clear this is medical software, and you're intended for medical use. And so now you do have to take you have to take responsibility for the whole platform. And and generally speaking, the trickiest part of all this is the display. It's not to say it's the only issue with uh, with mobile devices, as I'll, as I'll get into. But it is part. But it is the the major part of it. The reason why it's the part that we f we tend to focus on so much pun intended, is that is because it's the display that, that, that defines the PAX workstation, it's the display that defines the mobile device for medical imaging the most, for the most part. Other factors of security and bandwidth are other issues, but less so. Okay, so moving along. Uh, next, okay. So uh, just my relevant affiliations, I'm the scientific program committee chair for, uh, for uh, RSNA, for informatics, uh, I'm a member of ACR here, uh, IT informatics committee, and I represent, to, represent representative to them for the FDA, uh, and also do some work with SIM. Okay, so an overview of my talk. I'm going to talk about the uh, history of mobile devices, a little a brief history of them, the medical image types so you can understand not all medical images are the same. And I, even here, I'm just talking about the radiologic medical imaging. I'm not talking about pathology, and I'm not talking about you know uh, video-assisted thoracic surgery and all those other kinds of things. Just talking about radiologic imaging. 
Um, but I'll talk about just briefly about them. And they, each one has characteristic size, resolution, and pixel pitch, just about to understand what, how that works. Uh, the luminance, the brightness of the, uh, of the device, a little bit of calibration conformance testing, and to know, you know, it's a bottom line to a doctor saying, hey, can I use this? You know, and if so, how so, and when? And when is it okay and when is it not okay? Um, and, and talk about the, the different use cases for different people also. You know, uh, there's, the, there's the referring doc, there's the radiologist, and then there's also the patient. Um, and then try to hopefully draw some conclusions. Okay, so June 2007, and so when we have the uh, iPhone released, uh, seems like longer than that, but no, it's only five years. Uh, in January 2010 is when uh, MIM came out and, uh, and, and created their software for, uh, for mobile, and that's when the FDA said, wait a second, this is different. This is not substantially equivalent to predicate devices. You have to do something different here. You can't just slide this along and say, sure, it's just another evolution in our software. Um, you know, from, from our, uh, you know, from our uh, PC-based software to uh, the mobile. Uh, and so they said, you, got it. You, have to, you have to go through, uh, we have to look at this here, and we have to go through pre-market approval. Uh, before the FDA even responded, the iPad came out <laughs> in April 2010, and people are already you know, experimenting with putting uh, chest x-rays on that. Uh, but then, and, and then, and then June 2010, already uh, was when uh, you had the iPhone 4 with, ret with retinal display, again, to what does it mean retinal display? You know, uh, that means this is basically, it's as much as, as tiny pixels and as many pixels as your eye can digest at the viewing distance which you would hold a phone from your eye. Um, this guy from University of Utah, uh, Dr. Jones, I think is his name, who said, actually your retina can see twice as much information were it not for the fact that there's a lens in between the retina and the object that you're seeing. <laughs> but the human lens, actually, uh, you lose about half the resolution of the, of the light hitting your eye. If uh, you could somehow you know, focus the, the light more efficiently than, the, than your natural born lens, you could see more probably uh, based on the number of cells in your retina. But uh, given the amount of light that actually does get through to your retina, it's about as much information as your eyes gonna be able to see at a viewing distance. And making the pixels any smaller than that, you won't see anymore. Um, but in February 2011, the FDA cleared the, the PAC software, and at that time, you know, really to their credit, they recognized, the, you know, they recognized what was going on, and they said, okay, if we're gonna give you the clearance, we're gonna clear at the same time for both iPhone and iPad, because they recognized that that, that had happened in the meantime. Um, and, uh, and they said it's for, you know, for, for non-radiography, for CTMR, nuclear medicine, PET, not intended to replace full workstations and is indicated for use only when there's no access to a workstation. That, so that was their cautious you know, uh, approval of it in that way. Um, so just uh, so some, uh, just to get a general sense of the image types, small and big, all right, make it easy. Most things are small, CT, MR, ultrasound, nuclear medicine, x-ray angiography, all these modalities, you know, uh, your standard CT image is a quarter of a megapixel. It's amazing, of all the things that have changed over the years, that hasn't. It's still, the, the, it had to do with the constraints of computers, how much, how much data they're gonna collect and what to expect. They made a CT image a quarter of a megapixel. And I can pretty much say as a radiologist, it's, it's really fine. You really don't need more in a, in, a, in a given CT image. If I need to see something that's smaller, we just make a smaller scanned field of view. So instead of me spreading out those, those 512 by 512 among your abdomen, I may constrain it down to just around your wrist. So I'll still get the resolution that I need to see. It just You make a smaller scanned field of view, but I only need 512 by 512 pixels in order to see what it is I need to see for any of your body parts and you know, for the, the amount of information I get from a CT scan anyway. It's not like, oh, if I only had more resolution, I could see more, not really. And when, when I need to do that actually for your pulmonary arteries and things I'm looking for pulmonary emboli, yeah, so again, we just constrain the scan field of view and we reconstruct to let that fill my 512 by 512 and that's fine. Um, but the, that's the size of these images and really MR is even smaller than that. Ultrasound tends to be about that size. Nuclear medicine is even smaller than that. You know, some of these actually, X-ray angiography may go up to one megapixel image, but still, uh, it, they're, they're not that big. That's one thing. But more importantly, uh, this you can only tell you, if you, when, you uh, when you are a medical imager, you are a radiologist, and can explain to you, these images tend to have higher inherent contrasts. These are not eye tests. It's not like, you know, can you see, you know, oh, is this that subtle, whatever. It's not subtle. It's just a question of understanding what you're looking at and understanding the clinical meaning of it. But it's not like it's hard to see. You know, when you're first, when you're first your radiology resident, you're like, everyone's looking at you, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you're like, what? Where? Uh-huh. You know, but, but after a while, you realize, oh, it's staring you right in the face. It's not hard to see. It's just that you don't know what it is. Um, that's, that's small matrix images. That's the nature of, uh, of, of uh, diagnosis on those. Whereas large matrix images, that's basically radiography, the x-ray image, the thing that got this whole field started 112 years ago, whatever it is, you know, at this point. You know, the, the x-ray image, whether it's computer radiography, digital radiography, they're both computer, they're both digital, Call it what you will, it's just a way of taking a projection radiograph 
you know, the good old X-ray image. Uh, so these are their five megapixel. I think MGH now has 12 megapixel chest X-rays. I don't know why, but they do. I don't know what you're going to see more, but uh, but that they they're large. They're much larger. I mean, they're talking 20 times larger than a CT image. And more importantly, they do contain the subtle contrast. They do contain the small pneumothorax, you know, where you have a, where your lung starts collapsing, you start getting air in, in between the the lung and the, and the chest wall. Uh, where subtle calcifications sometimes are meaningless and sometimes mean everything. Um, these are things, they are eye tests, and these are the things that, and you can have an experienced radiologist who knows how to look at everything, um, mm -hmm. but if their eyesight's not so good, they could miss it, because these are subtle. These do, these are the things that, uh, that do matter and can be subtle and you don't want to miss, and you can miss because they can be small and they can be of low contrast. And, uh, and therefore, the biggest eye test in radiology still is the thing that, that's the oldest image that we have, the x-ray image. Uh, and it's the most challenging, actually, to uh, to perform diagnosis on, uh, just if it's just from a from a uh, you know pure image point of view. So with that, uh, the, we we understand this distinction, and that plays itself out into how into the constraints that we need for for display. Clearly, a radiologist ideally would say, "Well, I won't want display for everything." Okay, well then shoot for the highest requirements, which would be for radiography. Um, but recognizing that, well, there may be some circumstances where I have maybe radi truth is radiography does not tend to be the hottest modality that needs to be interpreted overnight, sometimes. But more, more you know, by far, you know, 90, 95% of the time, when they need to start reading in the middle of the night, it's on a CAT scan, which has far less, far lower requirements. And you may say, well, what difference does it make? Why don't you just have one, one size fits all? Well, that's great, but what if I tell you that your mobile device can do very well for CT but not plain film, and it's gonna cover 95% of what you need? Well, then that, then that does matter. You know, depending on what, what the clinical need is, what the, what the requirements are and what the clinical need is. Uh, so for display size, did, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm giving you some information for what I would use for a desktop display, meaning under normal viewing conditions, so that you can, you can compare to what am I giving up by going mobile, and does it matter? So for routine primary diagnosis, a display needs to be, I would say, roughly 20 to 24 inch diagonal for, for radiography. Um, some people, like, the, like a 30 inch panel or something like that, where they're really using it as, uh, as, as a double wide panel. So instead of a, a pair of monitors, they're having one big monitor. And some people like that, some people like it lumped, some people like it split. I personally like it split, so that way I can arc them, you know, tilt them a little bit normal to me. That's my preference. Some people really like it one big monitor. Radiologists tend to use, uh, to use two imaging displays or two halves of a display. That tends to be how we use it. We compare a current to a prior, a frontal to a lateral, a with contrast to a without contrast. We do tend to do A to B comparisons. Um, not so much A to B to C to D, and if I did even, I would do it not at the same time. Human beings aren't really good at comparing more than two things at a time, um, you know, at, at one time. You know, and then I'd flip it from AB a, to AC to AD or something like that, you know, but, uh, but not so much all at one, all at one time. Um, and uh, the, uh, so that that's tends to be how we use the, the displays. And, that's, and if I had to read out 100 or 200 chest X-rays in a day, which I've had to do, Sometimes I know people have done more than that, <laughs> but um, you know, it's, uh, that's generally what you're gonna wanna use to be able to really plow through them pixels you know, uh, at, a, at a good clip without worrying about missing stuff. Um, for, for clinical review, really where the diagnosis has already been made, so we're, now we're talking about the referring doc wanting to see what that tumor, or that pneumonia, or that fracture looks like. So for here, really almost anything goes because we're not worried about them missing something, it's already been you know, plowed. It's already been, been uh, certainly, you know, every pixel's been plowed by the radiologist. There already is a conclusion. And if they want to look at it, that's fine. And if they want to look at a better monitor, go right ahead. But, you know, but we're not worried about the misdiagnosing uh, a referring doc on, on, uh, for, for just for a clinical review. I'm going to talk about sometimes when you think that's what they're doing, but they're not. <laughs> they actually are acting, you know, on, on the pixels that they're seeing in a way not based on the radiologist's report. And that's different. That is primary diagnosis. So, um, but, uh, but re and recognized by comparison, you know, iPod is about three and a half inch diagonal, uh, three and a half inch diagonal, and iPad is about ten inch diagonal. So these are substantially smaller by design. They're meant to be for on the go. That's what they're there for. You know, and not a PAX workstation monitor doesn't fit in my pocket. You know, <laughs> and uh, and so that's that's what this is about. So what about pixel pitch? This is the size of the pixels. Um, I think there was an excellent point that was made. Uh, in the uh, latest revision of the ACR's ACR AAPM SIIM Technical Standard for Electronic Practice of Medical Imaging, <laughs> um, that's the that's our, in our technical standards section of the, uh, the American College of Radiology. You'll see this guideline that uh, was just revised, uh, I believe, about two three months ago. 
this revision came out, probably maybe even less than that, uh, where, which is a major revision for anybody who is familiar with the standard from before. This is a, a big change, far much more change than they've had anything I've seen over the past seven years, um, where they um, really modernized the, uh, the requirements here, uh, the, or the recognition, that's just uh, the guidelines that they gave. Um, but they finally made a point that I've been making for, uh, for a number of years, which is to say, it doesn't really matter the number of pixels in the image that you're looking at for the number of pixels on your screen. Because the number of pixels in your screen actually doesn't matter either. What really matters is this overall size of the display, right? Because like, I don't care you know, how many pixels you put on my watch. I'm not going to read a chest x-ray off of it. It's too small you know, uh, at, at any distance from my eye, right? Uh, and the, that, so the size of the display matters, and the size of the pixel matters. Because the closer I hold a device to my face, the more I can see, up to a point, right? Up to, if, you get my, if you get beyond my, uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, angle of convergence, the point where I can't focus anymore, it's too close. But it, once you get up to, you know, as close as you can hold something and still see it and still focus on it, um, that's the smaller you want to make the pixels in order to be able for your, you know, for your eye to, uh, to fully appreciate the resolution of what's there. The farther away it is, the less you can resolve. So you can make the pixels small, but you're not helping anyone by it because you, you can't appreciate it, can't see it. The pixels at Times Square on those big you know, information displays, those are huge pixels because the closest anyone's looking at them is like 20 feet away practically. You know, those, those pixels are like a centimeter or more you know, uh, on a side uh, because it doesn't make, there's no point in making them smaller. Um, so it really, it's really a function of how close do you hold the display to your eye. How close you hold the display to your eye depends on, number one, is it mobile or is it sitting on a desktop? You know, so if it's sitting on a desktop, I'm sitting away from like over here. If it's mobile, so now it's an iPad, I may hold it closer, but I, people don't tend to do this with their iPads. It, they'll sit back from it a little more because it's a bigger device. The phone is probably the thing you hold closest to your eyes because that's, that's a, it fits in your pocket, it's the smallest you'd, you'd want it to be, and, and so there, that's when it makes sense to make the smallest pixels there. So how many pixels do you wind up with on the device? It's really just A times B equals C. Tell you the size of the pixels and the size of the device, and then I'll tell you how many pixels you end up getting from that. But the number of pixels doesn't really matter so much. It's a matter of did you size the display and, this, and the pixels to the condition that you're expected to be used. So to give you a sense of how these things go hand in hand, um, here's, we like to refer to displays as the 1K or the 1 megapixel or the 2 megapixel, the 3 megapixel. Why? Because that's a handy one number to use, like your camera. It's a 3 megapixel camera. It's a 10 megapixel camera. You know, if you really know cameras, you'll understand that that's, that doesn't tell you much about quality either. Um, but, uh, but still, it's a handy one number to get us to get, wrap your head around. Um, but uh, but what, how does that play itself out in manufacturing? So you can see that a 1 to 2 megapixel display, which is your typical desktop display, uh, so that's the, the pixel pitch is by 270 microns. That's you know, 0 0.270 uh, millimeters. So uh, whereas the three megapixel displays uh, that, that you typically buy, the medical grade the displays, those are about 210 microns. So they're smaller. This is, a, this is the size of a square on a side. Right? The five megapixel display, they're even tinier. They're 170. You know? And then the, then the six megapixel display, what happened there? How come it jumped up? Because that's really, it's really a pair of threes. <laughs> just joined together. That's why it's the same pixel pitch roughly as the threes. Uh, so, what happens, so what happens with, uh, with iPhone and iPad? You'll see how they, how they stack up against it. You'll see that the size of the pixels, whoa, way down there, 78 microns for the uh, iPhone. And, and why? Because you hold it really close to your face. And so they'll make the pixels really, really tiny. But when you, when you combine that with the size of the display, you find out that you only have 0.6 megapixels there. It's not a lot of pixels <laughs> by, by comparison. But it doesn't matter because it's as much as your eye is going to see at that distance anyway. So it's okay. You know, uh, if, you, if they made the iPhone any bigger, it wouldn't be an iPhone, it'd be an iPad, <laughs> right? Or an iPad mini or whatever they're gonna do. You know, you'd hold it further away from your face. So, and you see even the, the new iPad 3, you know, we're, they're not calling it the iPad 3, the new iPad, whatever they wanna call it. You know, they, uh, the, even that, they didn't bring the pixel size down as small as they did on the iPhone. Brought it down, but not the, to 96, because again, why, that's as much as you're going to see any smaller, and it's just a waste. Um, in a similar vein, I mean, I had, we were talking about this before, where the, the mammography displays, uh, they would make a five megapixel mammo display, and, and which I think you know, the FDA requires still at this point, which I think they're, they're getting on the verge of relaxing, but, um, um, but I had mammographers who do what with a five megapixel display? Take a magnifying glass to, this, to the screen to bring back up to visible range the pixels. <laughs> so, well, you're over-engineered. So, no joke, 
we do this. Yeah. So uh, again, what about brightness? So uh, moving along. So desktop displays, uh, medical, you can set them to pretty much whatever you want, anywhere up to like 1,000. But, but practically speaking, you'll set them at about 400 candela per meter squared. Just, I know people don't know that unit, but just to give you a sense, your typical desktop display that you're going to buy is running at about 250. Okay, just to give you a sense of, of, of brightness of things. So medical display is, is, is uh, decidedly uh, uh, brighter, right at 400. Consumers start about 250. They die from there. Some start lower. And even when you buy it, you find, you'll find that, like, if you actually measure the dang thing, like, a year later, it's going to be down to 200 or 180 or whatever. But you won't notice because it's going to happen slowly, like any light bulb decaying. Um, mobile displays, you see that they they're actually can get pretty bright. Um, but be careful uh, because... They, why do they get so bright? They get so bright because you might want to use, you might want to actually make a phone call on the beach. And it'd be pretty annoying if your flip phone, you could see the buttons, but your new cool touch phone, you can't make a phone call at the beach because you can't see the numbers. You know, so they have to make them get, be able to get very bright. Uh, at the same time, they have lots of power management built into them to make sure they don't waste too much energy in making it bright when you don't need it because that'll decrease the battery life. So they play a huge game of power management and trying to, you see how your screen goes dim and it goes off and then it comes back on and when it's on it gets dimmer unless you're really using it. And they play all these games to try to conserve power. So you gotta be careful when wanting to use these for medical imaging because your desktop displays don't play this game because they're not being moved around so much they don't have to worry about power management, they're plugged in. So what about a calibration? Okay, I'm running over a little bit, but here um, I want to spend a little bit of time on this just so you understand. Most people's eyes glaze over when they hear about calibration. They say, can I not worry about this? Can this be someone else's problem? Because I don't really understand this. Okay, but I'll, I, I will make it simple enough that even a radiologist can understand. Um, so in order for the, what calibration is basically making sure that you can see all the shades of gray that the display is trying to show your eye. Because if it's, if we can show you two shades of gray that a photometer can measure as different, but your eye can't, then there's no point. Because the display is not made for a computer or for a photometer. It's made for your eyeball. And so if there's a difference that you can't see, then that's no difference at all. It's got to be something that you can perceive as different. And so all kinds of studies in science were done in order to figure out, well, what is that? How much difference do I have to make from one shade of gray to the next so that the human, the average human being, can detect that? And so there's a formula, and they, they did the work on that. So now, but the, and, and so the computer or the device can know what that's supposed to be, but it's one funny thing about computers, they can't see themselves. They don't come with built-in mirrors, neither do we. If we want to look at ourselves, we've got to look in a mirror, right? And so, so too with the computer, it can't see what's coming out on the screen. It knows what it's trying to put there, but it has no idea what you're seeing, unless you give it eyes to see itself. And that's what a sensor is. That's what a, uh, now it can be an external sensor, like a puck that you put on the screen, it's a USB device, or it can be something built into the monitor that pops out across the screen, but something the computer says, oh, that's what's coming out on the screen when I give you this digital driving level? Had I known that, whoo, I would have done something different. And so it adjusts itself until it says, now I know I, that you're seeing what I want you to be seeing, doctor. Okay, that's what, the, that's what calibration is about, making sure the device is, is, is outputting what it's supposed to be. So again, the, the, the front, this, if, it next, if it's an external sensor, it's a manual process. If it's an internal sensor, it's built into the, to the screen or whatever, so it can pop out automatically or you know, and take care of itself uh, you know, uh, by itself. Uh, the, uh, the sensor functions, it, it keeps the brightness constant. It allows you to do the checking on it. It allows to recalibrate the thing if it needs to be. These are wonderful, wonderful things that sensors do. What about mobile? Well, the traditional method uh, uses a photometer, but you can't access the video subsystem of these devices. They don't come with built-in photometers, and they won't let you plug one in either. They're so rude, you know, these devices. So they're closed, so what do you do? So necessity was a mother of invention, and so uh, they, they developed this tap test, or it's one of the tests, and then Aldo was showing you the, their CAPTCHA-like test, you know, some kind of external test to determine compliance and, and try to correct it. And in some ways, this is way better than anything we had before, because before, the, the sensors can only de detect the quality of the device. But the tap test tests not only the device, but also the, the impact of the ambient light and your eyes. Maybe the problem is the device, or maybe you need new glasses, doctor. You know, we never tested that before. And that's, this does, these types of tests that where we were unable to test the device directly, that we have to get the human being involved, is actually a good thing because we test more and we actually get to what we're, this is all really about. It's not really about making sure the device is conformant to the DICOM curve, huh? No, what I care about is, doctor, are you seeing what you're supposed to be seeing? And if you're not, then there's a problem here. Now, it may be the device, it may be the light, it may be you. Whatever it is, get it fixed. And don't misdiagnose this patient because of it. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the luminance of mobile devices changes, whether they're, when they're plugged in, the battery life, power settings, all this kind of stuff. 
and therefore the tap test is only valid if none of those things change. So if I did the tap test and I read a case, you know, then and then the sun sets, as Aldo was saying. Well, then, you know, uh, then you then you uh, that that's not valid anymore. So that and that's going to play itself into the use cases. Uh, so conformance testing, okay. Well, just letting you know, some like New York State, other states are getting to this game. They want they want better testing. And what I want to come to is really just the last point over here is, uh, or the last two points, is that you need some kind of centralized monitoring system to get the records on, your, on, the, on the calibration of your displays. And that should include mobile. It can include mobile. The, the technology is first coming out now from the software manufacturers, either directly themselves or by partnering with a third party to be able to tell you, here's how we can make sure that when your radiologist was making a primary diagnosis on their iPad, or their iPhone, that you can show that on that date, at that time, they made sure that that was valid, and that that was okay to use the device. And I will, and I would actually take exception. I'll say I would spend two minutes on an on an off case where I'm getting called by a resident at the proverbial golf course or whatever it is, you know, to to look at a case where I'm not reading 100 cases, I'm just reading that one case. I'll spend two minutes to make sure that I'm covered and that my display is functioning properly for this particular use that I have. Because after all, it's only occasional. It's only when I'm on the go. That's the point of this. So uh, this is just some pictures from the FDA's testing lab. They can test in different color conditions, how they do their testing. Um, they have their, their special cameras. They look at, uh, look at the devices, and there's another camera they had there. Um, it shows, this shows the different, they, they had, I think, a display that could show 1,000 shades of gray instead of 256 shades of gray. And it has had the look at mobile devices. Uh, just some, some pictures from my visit there. But uh, coming, coming back to the, to the use cases, um, the radiologist can use it for primary diagnosis, but only an, on an occasional basis, meaning nobody wants to read 100 chest x-rays off of an iPad. It's not designed for that. It's a pain. It's meant to be a mobile device to be on the go that if somebody needs to catch you for a case or two, that's fine, but it's not to be used for a primary workstation. I wouldn't want to use it that way. Um, and for the ordering clinician, though, uh, that's the main use case. Every time one case that a radiologist is going to read remotely, there's going to be probably 1,000, there was a referring doc or 10,000, that they want to look at that tumor fracture or, or pneumonia of their patient to see what it looks like so they can get a sense of how bad it is, they can, they can get a visual sense of it. Um, but recognize, as I was saying before, um, are you sure it's not for prior diagnosis? What about like an ICU, tubes and lines, if they want to feed a patient, they may not ask radiology. If that's what they're doing, you better make sure that what they're using is, is calibrated and, is, and has conformance checking. And also, what about showing things to a patient? How about you know showing you know the patient their own images? I heard they exist. So, uh, so conclusions: too small for routine primary diagnosis, but they may work well for occasional consultation, even for primary diagnosis. Uh, I would say for an iPad for for a chest X-ray and a phone. I would say for everything but uh, but a radiograph, just too large, you can't, not enough viewport to work with. But for cross-sectional, I think it's fine, uh, and it's essential for ordering clinician access in patients as well. Um, the uh, last uh, point I want to make, how do, again, how do we get here? Because you started out with where you had film, and the film, was, the film was the film, and that's all it was. And then you had the workstation where, well, they may choose to use medical displays, and they may not to. And now we've gotten to BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, and that's the, you know, where everyone has, a, has some kind of screen in their pocket, and they want to use it. And that's why this is a lot more complicated, but this is where we are today. And, and uh, the ACR and the FDA, we're, we're dealing with it. Questions? Stunned you all. <laughs>